say good morning. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. So we're continuing our journey through Sermon on the Mount. And we've reached this teaching uh, from Jesus concerning anger. And we talked last week how this issue of anger, how <clears throat> uh, it's much worse than the scribes and the Pharisees that they thought and portrayed to those that were listening to them. And so what happened is, is the Pharisees looked at the commandment and <clears throat> uh, solely on the basis of the actual physical act, the actually physically murdering someone, and they, they never talked about the inner person, the heart of the person. And so they would talk about the human, or talk about the consequences, talking about going before the court, the Sanhedrin and things like that, but never got to the heart of the issue. And so Jesus steps into this, this teaching that prevailed during that time, and Jesus is essentially saying, listen, th these guys, they've missed They've met, they're missing the entire point of the commandment. They don't get it. Because they had, tur they had turned <clears throat> into an uh, obtainable standard this commandment. Something that they could meet with their behavior, something externally that they could meet, they changed it to that. And that's a perspective of a man-centered view of God's standard of righteousness. And so they take God's standard of righteousness and they've slimmed it down into something that they could obtain externally they could say hey I've never actually murdered anyone I've never physically committed the act of murder therefore I've done commandment 6 and so even today people want to reduce the standard of God's righteousness to, a, to just this simple you shall not this negative side of things and we can check that off and that's external behavior modification, right? We know those types of things, and that's what the Pharisees seem to have been doing. And Jesus says, that's the wrong interpretation. But Jesus didn't stop there. He didn't just say that's wrong. He went on to give the correct interpretation. And so Jesus authoritatively says, you've heard it said, but I say to you, Jesus is going to take everything that they thought they knew, everything that, <clears throat> that they had been taught, that they thought they were viewing correctly, and He's going to take it to a deeper standard of the righteousness of God, the standard that God has. Instead of just this outward righteousness that the religious elite would teach them, He's going to take it much deeper than that. And Jesus would go into verse, verse 22, and essentially He'd be saying, Listen, let me tell you what this commandment actually means. This commandment goes to the way that your heart thinks. It goes to the way that you feel about things. It goes to your reactions. It goes to what you say to others regardless of whether you shed blood or not. It pertains to all those things. It pertains to the heart. So he's saying, listen, you can be guilty of the sin of murder without taking anybody's life. You can be guilty of the sin of murder without firing the shot. You can be guilty of that. And so yes, the sixth commandment prohibits the act of murder physically. But commandment six prohibits the attitude that leads to murder. It's not just simply the physical act. God's law has authority. Here's the thing. God's law has authority over the human heart. Not just authority over your action, but over your heart. What you're thinking on the inside, what you're chewing on in your head, what your motives are, all those things God is taking into account. And so the proper understanding of the law of God is to realize that it goes beyond what we do. It goes to your heart. And the Pharisees had covered all that up. 
The Pharisees had made it so that it was no longer plain and evident because they minimized the nature of the law. And what Jesus is doing in Matthew 5 is He's revealing, He's recovering the true intent of the law, what it's actually saying. And so just attitude, just words, are enough to produce guilt that leads to eternal condemnation. It goes deeper than what they'd heard. It goes deeper than what even many in our culture think. It thinks it goes beyond the outward act. It goes to the depths of the attitude of the heart. And listen, friends, that shows us how much we need the Gospel of Christ. It shows us how much we need the Gospel. Listen, by revealing that to you, by revealing that to me, it shows you God's made a way for you. But there's one way. One way. And it's through the Son who's even <clears throat> expounding upon this law. And so Jesus would follow everything that we talked about last week. He's going to follow this up with some illustrations. He's going to give some examples that lie in the text that we're going to be in today. And so let's read. We're going to be in verses 23 through 26, but let's read verses 21 through 26, Matthew chapter 5. Hear the word of the Lord. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we're grateful to be here today. God, it is a privilege to assemble on Your day, on the Lord's day. God, help us to not take that lightly. God, we pray that Your Word would go forward today. God, that You would challenge and change us as Your people. God, help us to see this text as, as Jesus is expounding it. We pray, Lord, that You would take your, the truth of Your Word, that You would press it upon our hearts, that we might bring glory and honor to You. God, You are good to us. Help us to see our great need for the Gospel. How we never get past the Gospel. And help us to preach Your Gospel. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So in this passage, Jesus... And listen, it's a practical passage. Very practical passage. And so Jesus gives us these, this illustration, these illustrations. He's going to give us some more in chapter 5 that help us to understand this inner righteousness that God requires of us. It's a heart righteousness. It's a, it's a righteousness in thought. It's a righteousness in motive. It's a righteousness in deed. And so God looks at the heart not simply at merely externals. That's what we do, don't we? We look at the external things because we can't look at the heart. God doesn't see things the way we see them. He sees all things. The depths of all things. And so as we learned last week, a person who has anger in their heart toward a brother has committed spiritual murder. Spiritual murder. Now the word that we see at the beginning of verse 23, if you look at that, verse 23 says, ESV has so... Now, if you've got the King James, maybe the New American Standard, it will say, therefore. And many of you have probably heard the saying. If you haven't, you're going to hear it now. When you see the word therefore, the word so, you need to look back before that to see what it's 
therefore. And so this word therefore, this word so, is, is connecting what Jesus has just previously said to what He's saying. And so what Jesus is saying, what He's going to teach us is that in light of what we read last week and what we studied last week, in light of verses 21 through 21 and 22, this is how you're to respond to anger. This is how you're to respond to resentment. And so I have two points that I want to make from these four verses. And both these points have to do with reconciliation. That's, that's the topic, that's, that's the theme that Jesus is trying to drive home. He's driving home this thing about reconciliation in these verses. And the first point, I want us to see the priority of reconciliation. The priority of reconciliation. You see, when we talk about reconciliation, you all know this, to be reconciled. Reconciliation has to, has to do with two parties being brought back together, putting them back together, right? Two parties that are at odds with one another, reconciling them, bringing them back together. And so when we have this attitude of murder in our heart, that attitude of murder distances us, not only from the brother, but it distances us from the Lord. It causes a breach in our relationship to the Lord, doesn't it? Now listen, that breach doesn't terminate the relationship. It doesn't make the relationship with the Lord just null and void. It doesn't do that. But what it does is it causes this strain upon the relationship, doesn't it? The closeness that was once there is not quite as close as it used to be. Now listen... <clears throat> The closest thing that I can come up with that maybe we can relate to that exists in our lives, something that resembles somewhat of what Jesus is saying here, what I'm saying about this breach in relationship, is the disobedience of a child. Parents know what, it, what it's like to have a, disobedience, a disobedient child, right? It strains that relationship. And so a child can do something that, that really bothers you, really disappoints you, and you, can, you don't just say, you're not my kid anymore. That young ain't mine no more. You don't just say that, right? But it does strain something. It strains the relationship a little bit. It causes a difficulty that wasn't there beforehand. So I don't think anybody in here is going to disown their children because of some disobedience. But listen... It affects how we respond, doesn't it? It affects how you respond to that child. It respects how that child responds to you for a season, for a time. And so for the adults in this room, listen, you can probably, even some of the kids, you can probably think of a time in your life when you acted like some kind of unruly punk. Right? And you knew better than to act like that unruly punk. You knew better than to do that. You can remember times like that. And you can remember how it ticked off, it disappointed your mom. And what happened? You ticked off, you disappointed your mom, especially if you're in a public place, you do that kind of thing. When it's over, what happens? Mom's not as close to you as, you, as she may have been at one point, right? There's a coldness, there's not a, there's not a, oh, you know, come up here and coddle type of thing going on. There's not a lot of, Hugging and loving, there's a little bit of coldness, maybe a little indifference, until you admit how horrible your behavior was. Until you acknowledge that you disappointed, that you done what was wrong. There was a strain in that relationship. And then when that's acknowledged, and you confess it, restoration takes place, right? That closeness can be restored. And so it is with God. I mean, with our Heavenly Father. Listen, He's not going to coddle and cuddle with a disobedient child. He's not going to do that type of thing. It strains the relationship with the Lord. And until you come to a place where you recognize, listen, my disobedience, when I, when I confess that my disobedience is what's brought about this strain, only then can reconciliation take place. I can be reconciled back with the Father, in right standing with the Father. 
But listen, He doesn't stop being our Father. Even in our disobedience, He doesn't stop being our Father. You don't lose your salvation. You may and you probably will lose the joy of your salvation, but you don't lose your salvation. In verse 23, He says, So if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go first. First. You see the priority. Leave your gift there at the altar altar, and go first. Be reconciled to your brother. And then... So you see a second priority. Then come and present your offering. Jesus, listen, Jesus says anger incurs a guilt before God. Therefore, seek to restore, seek to to heal this broken relationship. And He's saying, make this a priority in your life. Make it a priority. You see, when He says there in verse 23, He says, so if you... If you. Now in the English, we can use the word you in a singular sense. We can use the word you in a plural sense. But in this Greek sense of the word, he's using it in a singular sense. And so I could say, I'm speaking to you, all of you. I could say, James, I'm speaking to you, right? Speaking to you, and it's, it's James, right? And so English is kind of, Ambiguous, but in this Greek, it's singular. Therefore, if you find yourself in a position, here's what you need to do. That's what he's saying. He's, so he's making it personal. He's, he's making it personal. And so Jesus makes this, very, this verse very personal. But listen, I think it needs some explanation. I think we need to explain it a little bit. So if you personally are offering your gift at the altar... And there remember that your brother has something against you. Listen, if you were a Jew, you were a Jew in the first century prior to A.D. 70, you'd surely know what Christ is describing in this this illustration. In order for you to be reconciled to God, there would have to be some shedding of blood. Okay? There would be some repentance that would have to happen in your heart. You would recognize your sinfulness. And then, and so there would be this inward recognition, and in order for there to be an outward demonstration of your inward repentance, you would take an animal. Whatever animal was prescribed for that sin, some sins required maybe a, a dove or a bird, and some goat, lamb, some sins, a heifer to be offered. And then there was this day of atonement when the animal was offered for all the sins of Israel. But you would have this inward repentance that you would express. You would express this inward repentance by bringing either a lamb, a goat, a bird, something from your own flock or something that you purchased, and you would bring it to the temple. And this animal had to have be without spot. It didn't have any blemish. It didn't have any, any defects. It was a perfect animal, perfect sacrifice. And then you would lead that animal to the outer courtyard of the temple. You're either carrying it or you're leading it. And in this outer courtyard, that's where everybody would come. Everybody would come to the outward courtyard. It didn't matter who you was. There'd be all kinds of people praying. And you'd work your way up into the inner courtyard. You got to this inner courtyard, it would have a sign something like, if, you know, if you're not circumcised, you can't, you can't come in here. You got to stay out in the court of the Gentiles, right? But if you were circumcised, if you were a Jew, you could enter this inner courtyard, go through this wall of separation into the inner courtyard. You'd still be, you'd still have your animal. You'd be carrying your animal. You'd be leading your animal, whatever you had. And you'd you'd arrive at this inner courtyard of the temple. And this was this is where the priest was at, and this is where the priest would enter. And it was here that the altar of God was. It's where you would take your sacrifice and it would be slain. 
And it would be offered to God in its prescribed way. And there at, the, at this doorway, a priest, priest would come out. You'd tell him what you've done. You would tell him your sin. You'd give him this lamb or this, this goat, whatever it might be, whatever it was that you're offering, and you'd lay your hands on this animal and you would confess your sins. Offering this, this animal up for the sins that you've committed. And that animal would be slain. And that animal would give his life and it would be a symbol. Shed his blood symbolic to show an inward thing had happened. An outward action, an outward shedding of blood would show that an inward repentance had taken place. Now what Jesus is saying here is that if you take that animal and you walk through that temple into the innermost courtyard and you go up to the priest gate with your animal and you've recognized yourself as a murderer at heart, look at the phrase, and there remember that your brother has something against you. I mean, think about it. You've, done, you've walked through all these things. You've... You're carrying your sacrifice. You, you, you think you've repented. You're going to offer up this blood sacrifice to be, for this animal to be slain. You're in the innermost, innermost courtyard. You're offering it up. You let the priest take it. And all of a sudden, you remember your brother has something against you. Question. Who do you think could possibly, who do you think it could possibly be that would call that to remembrance at that particular moment? Isn't there a third person to the Trinity that that's what he does? He convicts the world of sin, he convicts men of sin. The Holy Spirit calls to remembrance, my brother has something against me. Listen, it's the Spirit of God who brings to remembrance right there. You see, it's the Spirit of God who says, listen, you can't worship right now. You can't worship me in that state. You understand that that's what's going on here. When, when, he, when somebody's bringing a sacrifice into the temple, this is an act of worship. It's an act of worship. And Jesus says there, if you remember that your brother has something against you, go. Notice He doesn't say, hey, just go ahead and offer up your lamb, go ahead and offer up your goat, your dove, whatever you got. Just make sure on your way out that you reconcile with your brother. That's not what it says. That's not what it says. Reconciliation is the priority. Jesus says if you get all the way up to this point, you're going through your religious duties and you think, listen, this is my spiritual act of worship. I'm going to offer this up. And He calls to mind the fact that you've got a brother has something against you. You leave and you go. You can't worship me in that state. Reconciliation is required for worship. Now listen, we've probably all heard it, heard it, seen it. Things that are promoted to, for churches to do that increase worship, increase attendance. Listen, if you'll just do this, I mean, we'll get flyers in the mail. Listen, if y'all just do this, listen... You can enhance your worship. You can increase the attendance. All kinds of people are going to worship. But according to this text, the greatest way, and let's, let's, take, let's bring this home. According to this text, the greatest way to increase worship here at New Hope is for everybody here to be rightly reconciled to their fellow man. 
You want to increase worship, we don't have to have a new band, we don't have to have smoke machines, we don't have to have colored lights, we don't have to have some, you know, great personality, we don't have to invite guests in to come and preach and all that kinds of things. What this text says, if you want to increase worship, you want to enhance it. If you want to worship rightly, you be reconciled to your brother. Because you don't worship until you're... If you have something against someone else, you don't worship until you're reconciled. Now again, many, many in our day would say, well, listen, you've got to get as many people to come and worship with you all as possible. But this text seems to imply that the Lord is not glorified in the amount of people that come to worship. The Lord is glorified with the holiness of His people that are worshiping. You understand? Those who are worshiping, God desires holiness. Well, we just need more people to worship with us. No, you just need holier people to worship. So what Jesus does, whether it's in private with God, in public with the people of God, I mean, He just, He cuts off this carelessness. It's like a stop sign in the road. He's saying, don't bring that in here. Don't bring, the, don't bring a hard heart in here. It's unacceptable. You've got to deal with things in your life things that, that come about it before you approach God in worship, you can't separate what's happened between you and your brother and your worship of the Lord, right? Between you and your God. You can't separate those. They actually fit together. The greater priority is reconciliation. So what Jesus says when you're coming to worship, what you must do You've got to clear the air. And you do that first. Make that a priority. It, don't, it doesn't matter how inconvenient it is. It doesn't matter. It, it might interrupt some plans. It, it may, it's definitely going to mean you're going to have to humble yourself. And basically what that does for us is it forces us to choose between our pride and true worship of God. That's, that's the stop sign in the row. You're going to let go of your pride and worship God? Or are you going to fake your worship of pride or fake your worship of God and hold on to your pride? Which are you going to do? And some might say, Well, I, I don't want to humble myself. I'm, I'm angry about it. This has been going on too long. I ain't, I ain't got to do that. And what Jesus would say, then don't kid yourself about worship. If that's how you feel, do not kid yourself about it. So clearly reconciliation required for worship. But I want you to notice something. It's required for the one in the wrong. Look at verse 23. Look at the end of verse 23. He says, and there remember that your brother has something against you. Listen, it doesn't say that you have something against someone else. It doesn't, that's not what this text says. It says that you remember that your brother has something against you. Now, flip to the right in your Bible to Matthew chapter 18, because this is the text that is always in my mind. Matthew 18, verse 15. Matthew 18. Because here's the one, for me it's the most familiar one to me, this one's always stuck in my head I guess. Verse 15 says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. 
And so according to Matthew 18, verse 15, if someone has done you wrong, it's your responsibility to go to them and tell them that they've done you wrong. That's what Matthew 18, 15 is saying. Your brother's done you wrong. They may, they may not know it. They may not, they may not <laughs> even know they've done anything wrong at whatsoever. But if you know they've done you wrong, you go to them and you tell them they've done you wrong. But listen, that's not what Matthew 5 here says. That's not what this verse says. It says that if you've done someone else wrong, you go to them and you tell them. You see, it's, it's not that you have a problem with them. It's that you've, you acknowledge, you recognize they have a problem with you. You've done something to them. Now listen, it's easy for us to say, well, you know what? They got a problem with me. They can just come see me. But Jesus said, if you know about it, whether you did it or they did it, it's your job to go to them and tell them. And then you can come worship me. You understand. There's no way out of this. You understand. Our relationships with one another, personal relationships, there's no out to this. Now granted, again, Matthew 18, 15 is one, if your brother has something against you, that's the only time i got to do it. No, this text says... If, it, if it's in your mind, you know you've done something, and there's the possibility you've done a brother wrong, you go to them. There's no outs. Reconciliation is that much of a priority. Because again, we can say, well, not my fault. They did, they did it, not me. But Jesus doesn't care whose fault it is. He doesn't care whose fault it is. If you know about it, you're supposed to do something about it. So Jesus has been talking about having anger in your heart toward a brother. And He's been saying that this attitude of the heart, being angry toward your brother, is the equivalent of spiritual murder. Okay? And then He's essentially saying, if you've caused a brother to have angry thoughts about you, then you need to leave and make it right before you think you can offer a sacrifice in this temple and think it's acceptable. If you've caused a brother to think that way, then you need to make that right. So, Jesus is saying, if you're in the act of worship, you're getting ready to worship by offering up your sacrifice, better to leave the act of worship and go be reconciled than to stay in fake worship. Better to stay away from the act of worship, be absent if God convicts you, and make that right. And so what God would really have you do, what Christ would, is calling us to, is take the opportunity and go and make peace. Go take care of it now. It's, it's an immediate thing. That's what Christ is teaching us. Because sin, listen... Sin in the heart annuls the worship of God. Let's look at a couple of Old Testament texts to kind of help us see that, that this is a general principle. Listen to Matthew 60, or not, sorry, Psalm 66, 18. I'm stuck in Matthew. Psalm 66, 18. Listen to this. If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Psalm 66, 18. Listen to Proverbs 28, 9. If one turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. Is an abomination. Listen, all of us, listen. We're all tempted to think that just just because we're doing something in worship, just because we're praying, automatically, automatically it's acceptable to God. That's what we think. Scripture makes it plain that that's not the case. 
These texts, if one turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. We're tempted to think that just because we come here and we do, we do these acts and we, we pray together and we do this kind of thing, that God just automatically accepts this type of stuff. It doesn't seem to be the case from what we've read. So listen, there, there needs to be a priority of reconciliation with a brother. It seems to be there, there's conditions to acceptable worship. So reconciliation is the priority. Second point, there's the urgency of reconciliation. So we see reconciliation must be a priority, but there's an urgency. Let's read verses 25 through 26 again. Look at what he says. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. There's an urgency to reconciliation. He says, come to terms quickly. Now listen, there's this principle that's true in every area of life. It doesn't just pertain to anger here. Listen, when the Word of God convicts you about something, if there's an area of obedience that you need to pursue, that you need to do, a sin that you need to confess, something that you need to get away from, a thing you need to say that you're convicted about, you can't be hesitant and, and not act upon it. We can't be hesitant to be obedient to God. I mean, if you think, if God convicts you about something, if the Word of God is pressed upon you, if it's made clear to you, this is what God says and this is what God expects, it's incumbent upon you to do it then. You see, we want to say, man, I'll do it later. Man, man. Yeah, it's important, but listen, I'll do it tomorrow. Listen, as soon as you accept that in your heart, as soon as you accept that immediate obedience to Christ is something that you can postpone, something that you can delay, you're flirting with disaster, man. You're in a place that you don't need to be. You're skating on thin ice. Because a true disciple of Christ, obedience to Christ is the priority. Obedience to Jesus is the priority. And he says reconciliation is the priority if you're going to be obedient to me. So being obedient to Christ, whatever the consequences of obedience are, everything else is secondary to that. I must obey. I must do this. Now listen, let me give you an example. One of the things that you often see postponed for many that claim to be followers of Christ is believer's baptism. That's one of the things that you often see postponed. And maybe there's some in this room that have said, you know, I need to be baptized and I recognize that, but I'm going to do that later. It's not that urgent. Yeah, I came to Christ, but you know, baptism doesn't save you. I know that. But on what basis when Christ <clears throat> on what basis when Christ said be baptized, can you say I'll do that later? Listen, what I'm telling you is is when you condition yourself when you, when you dull your conscience, when you say, I can put that off, I'll do that later, you're, you're conditioning your conscience to say, delayed obedience is okay. But listen, delayed obedience is disobedience. It teaches you to have this attitude that you're comfortable with sin. You understand? Oh, I, I, I'll do that later. Listen. Yeah, I know that's the right thing. I'll do that later. 
And before long, it's, it's lighter and it's lighter and it's lighter and it's lighter until you're, you just find yourself that at every point of what you should have been obeying Christ in, you've compromised on the timing. You've said, no, I'm Lord of the timing on everything. And there's no urgency. And essentially what we're saying is, I've got better things to do than to obey Christ right now. Now listen, I know you wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. We'd never say that with our words. But that's what our actions are demonstrating. That I've got better things to do. I've got better stuff to do. But listen, flip to Luke chapter 6. I want you to see this text. Luke chapter 6. Beginning in verse 46. Listen to what Jesus says right here. Luke 6, verse 46. I'm going to read through 49. Verse 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep, laid a foundation on the rock, and when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the, on the ground without a foundation. And when the stream broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Listen, friends. There should be an, there should be an urgency in our obedience to Christ. Just as there should be an urgency in your obedience to be reconciled to a brother, there should be an urgency in all of your obedience to Christ and reconciliation to a brother is part of that. Now if you look at verse 25, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court. And so it's, it's Jesus, talk, in verse 25, He's talking about <clears throat> in this context of conflict. Listen, His real point is, He's not really, His, his point is not legal manners. He's trying, to, he's trying to demonstrate a point, right? The larger point is, that He's making is about anger, broken relationships, that kind of thing. Conflict. And so His point is, what, the point is what people are doing on the way to court to resolve things before they get there. What he's saying is, is that's the kind of attitude you need to have with conflict in your life. You deal with it before it gets worse. That's what he's saying. Listen, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. So from things I've read, things I've heard, when there's two parties in a lawsuit, they, try to, they tend to try to settle things quicker the closer the trial date gets. They try to settle things before the date of the court proceeding, right? And it has to do with the same point that Jesus is trying to make here. When you go into court with a lawsuit, when you get to that point, then it's out of your hands. It's in the court's hands now. And the judge, the judge may rule against you. The jury may find, <clears throat> the jury may find your opponent is right. They agree with your opponent and you lose everything. You lose everything that was at stake because you went to court. But if you made an agreement before, you made a settlement beforehand, before you get to court, listen. That's something you can control. On your way 
Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court. Both parties can give a little bit. Both sides can give a little bit. And in a sense, both win in in that regard, you could say. And so Jesus applies that to personal conflict. And He says this is urgent for you to do quickly. Why? Why is it such a big deal that we do this quickly? That we handle it quickly? Because God disciplines His people. If you don't resolve conflict while it's in your hands to resolve it, it may get to the point where it's out of your control. There may be consequences that you'd rather not see. People may know God may discipline because you didn't resolve it. You had the opportunity to resolve it. It's always better to handle a situation. It's a whole lot better when it's a small thing. Just deal with it than for it to get worse and worse and worse. You get to court. You're handed over to the judge. You're handed over to the guard. And you're put in prison. Now listen, verse 26. He says, Truly I say to you, you'll never get out until you've paid the last penny. He's picturing this thing, what's known as a, a debtor's prison. Before you get to a debtor's prison. So it said that then they'd be placed into a prison until they paid the last penny. Now Jesus, I mean spiritually speaking, Jesus is saying your anger is sinful. Therefore resolve it before you incur greater discipline from God. Now listen, for the believer, we don't want to incur greater discipline from God by being disobedient. Listen, it doesn't mean you lose your salvation again. It doesn't mean that, but you will be disciplined every child of His And disobedience will be disciplined. But this could possibly have eternal discipline. Eternal hell for those who have never been born again. Jesus says the right time for you to act upon conflict, when you're you're conscious of the conflict, when you're at odds, it's immediate. It should be urgent. Now listen, it's not a solution to the problem to run away from the problem without talking about it. It's what some of us want to do. That's our, that's our default, right? Instead of dealing with a problem, some of us just, well, I'll go this way, I'll avoid that. But running away from it is not the answer. Clamming up, ignoring it, whatever. Trying to give it enough time that it doesn't bother you so bad. It's not a solution. Listen, it's not a solution in the church to say, hey, I'm I'm unhappy, I'm leaving, I ain't going to talk to nobody, I ain't going to tell nobody, I'm I'm out. Done. That's That's not the solution. That's not the right solution. It's actually sinful for us to live that way because Christ says if there's conflict, you need to resolve it. It's not resolved through avoidance. But it's resolved through a humble interaction between parties. Listen, this text is clear. Reconciliation must be a priority. And it must be done urgently in the life of of a believer. Reconciliation is a priority. But now listen. 
We've talked about reconciliation between brothers at odds. But let me tell you something that's even greater. Is if you've been reconciled to a holy God. And the only thing that can reconcile you to a holy God is shed blood, just like that blood that was symbolic in the old when they offered their sacrifice in the temple. It pointed to something greater. It pointed to a lamb that would take away the sins of the world. And that lamb's name is Jesus. And that lamb is the only way that you can be reconciled to God. If you've not come through that lamb, under that blood, through that sacrifice, you are at odds with God. And listen, they will come when you will pay every last penny. Unless reconciliation takes place. So listen, what I'm telling you, unbeliever, is be reconciled now. And what I'm telling you, believer, is if there's, if you're at odds with somebody, be reconciled now. Don't cause a breach. Do what Christ commands us to do, what He tells us to do. An unbeliever, run to Jesus before it's too late. I beg you, let's pray. Father, we're thankful for Your Word. I'm thankful for this body. And God, I pray that You would bless Your church. God, help us to see what Christ has taught us today. Help us to understand it. Help us press it upon our hearts, God, that we may act as You see fit. God, help us to strive for an inner righteousness that men can't see, but God, You see clearly. God, You know all things. You see all things. And You can do all things. And God, we pray for Your power to be upon this assembly. We pray, God, that You would lead us in paths of righteousness, not for us, but for Your name's sake. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.